Praise the Lord. Shall we please pray together? Our Father and our God, we thank you for bringing us uh, together for our LDG this year. Thank you for how you have sustained and kept the vision of this work over the years. And thank you, Lord, that we can gather in various places and centers to again sit around a table that will join us again for the last days. We recognize that all that we need to do in preparing for the coming of our Lord has remained pertinent. And this morning, as we begin to look at the word of God again, please come to us. We ask that you speak deeply and clearly to our hearts and mobilize our hearts to sincerely uh, get ready for our coming King. Thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'd like to thank God for the privilege he has given to us again to gather together for this uh, year's MLR. Even though we are doing it at zonal levels, we are grateful to God for all of us that are present at this particular time and those that are going to be joining uh, from various places and centers. We trust that God we uh, visit us and bless our lives, particularly in the name of Jesus Christ. We are going to take our theme. Uh, I'll begin to talk from our theme this morning. Uh, Behold, the bridegroom comes. And our theme text had been taken from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. And Matthew 25, that's a very uh, strong passage that talks about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And from verse 1 to the very end of that chapter was raising different issues that we need to think about in preparing for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you just take the whole book, the whole chapter 25, you will see that there are several things that Jesus used to illustrate as parables uh, for his coming and what we need individually to do. Uh, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins which was the first, that's where we are going to situate our discussion for this time. The parable of the talents, the, the assignment that he gave that we need to be doing before he comes, the parable of the talents. And then the coming judgment of the nations when the master will come. And then the separation of those that are sheep from the goats, those that pretend to be Christians, but they are not, or those that are inside the folk, but they do not really belong to the Lord. Uh, all of this, they are all matters that we need to take note as we talk about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But for this particular uh, meeting, we are going to be focusing particularly on Matthew 25. And I would like to read from verse 1 to verse 13. I will try to first give a, a general overview of the story. And then we will settle on a few issues that is very pertinent to us at this time. So I'd like to read Matthew 25, we read from verse 1 up to verse 13. 
Now, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, Say, no, lest there should be, and it should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. May the Lord bring increase to his word as we study and as we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, uh, like I said, looking at the entire uh, book of Matthew, uh, maybe from chapter 24 and 25, there have been several discussions. Actually, in chapter 24, the disciples ask him, tell us what will be the signs of your coming. And what will be the sign of the end of the world? And what shall be the end of all things? They were asking very serious questions. And the Lord Jesus was very definite. Uh, he was not ambiguous about what will happen. He was not ambiguous that he is coming. It was not ambiguous that this world is going to come to an end. It was not ambiguous of how his coming will be. It was not ambiguous as regards uh, the manner of his second coming. The manner of his second coming. If we are, if we are to just do all of that during this meeting, it will have taken us all the time start talking about the second coming, the manner of it, the way in which it will come, and what will be the circumstances around the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But this particular meeting itself is not going to allow us to do all of that because of the shortness of the time and the focus that we are giving the meeting. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. I think our major emphasis here is to create and to raise an alarm in our hearts as regards the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and what we need to do in respect to that. But just to lay a general foundation is just to note that there are certain things that will happen uh, preceding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there are certain things that we must do uh, in order to prepare ourselves for his coming. Uh, this particular parable that we want to deal with 
is the need for preparation for his coming. Preparing adequately for the coming bridegroom. That will be the strong focus that I need to draw now. Preparing adequately for the coming bridegroom. Even though the announcement said, Behold, the bridegroom comes, it did not benefit those who did not prepare adequately. It did not change the destiny of those who were ill prepared for his coming. So the first point that I was going to be looking at is adequate preparation for the coming bridegroom. Now, let's look at the story as it is. We just study it as it is and see what God will have us do. The, the Lord Jesus was the one who gave this parable. So it is not hearsay. And it is not another person trying to make an inference. This is the Lord Jesus himself speaking. Those of you that carry your red letter Bible, you will notice that everything from that verse 1 uh, almost to the end of the chapter, actually, was Jesus speaking without any interruption. Did you notice that? You notice that the entire 46 verses of chapter 25 had no interruption of anybody. It was Jesus speaking. Nobody asked him for prayer. Nobody interrupted him with a miraculous need. No. The time he was concentrating on this matter does not require interruption. Does not require looking left and right. No distraction. And also I like to say that when we begin to talk about the second coming of Christ and adequate preparation for it, it requires no distraction. It requires focus. It requires concentration. We need to concentrate. What must I do not to miss the final day? How do I prepare so that all my journey will not be in vain? There's need to focus on that without distraction. There's need to be deliberate because we have come to a generation of many, many, many distractions. We have come to a generation of many, many, many activities. These activities, they are even church activities that will not allow you to adequately get ready for the coming bargain. We may come at an hour that you did not expect. Look at the end of that verse 13. Say, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now, that verse 13, that verse 13 was creating a need for me and you to know that if your preparation for the Lord and for his coming, if it is not what you are doing daily, you are doing uh, intentionally, you are doing deliberately, and you are doing it at all times, you may miss out. So the matter I want to raise this morning is the kind of adequate daily regular preparation for his coming. You see, if to say he will give us and said a brethren on the 20 uh, on the 25th day of June 2023, uh, all of you should gather in Equa Church, Makodi, because the Lord will come. If you say there's something like that, then you can be doing anything you like. When it remains about two weeks, then you just do a crash program. 
Have you? So that you can meet it. But I want to assure you, nobody will enter to heaven by crash program. No one. Actually, the Bible said it will come at an hour that you do not expect. It will come at a point as if, in fact, the Bible said the coming of Jesus will be like a snare. It will look as if it was deliberate so as to catch those that are not ready, those that are pretending, those that are just living anyhow. So, what therefore? So, the first word that I want to bring before I go into the whole meeting is that this necessary daily regular preparation for the coming bridegroom requires a watchful spirit. It will require a watchful spirit. It will require a life that is on the watch. It will require a lifestyle that is watchful. A lifestyle that is not careless. A lifestyle that is not allowing little, little imperceptible omissions. A life that is deliberately taken. Should the Lord appear when I did not think he will, will he still meet me ready? When we were younger, we sang songs about the coming of the Lord. It bothers me that I go for meetings, fellowships, nobody sings about his coming again. Before we finish any meeting, I know nowadays, when I hear you to share the grace, then the next time they say, I will face one another and say, His goodness and mercy shall do what? Shall follow me all the days of my life. But in our own days, we don't do that. We face one another and say, In case, in case he comes before we meet next, be sure I meet you up there. We greeted one another, Maranatha. Maranatha. When we finish our meeting, when we finish sharing the grace, we just look at one another, Maranatha. You know the meaning of Maranatha? He is coming soon. He is coming soon. Don't be careless. He may come in the morning, he may come in the night, he may come in the afternoon, he may come when you don't know. He, he may come anytime. Maranatha. We greeted one another like that. We charge one another like that. We knew if you were sleeping with your wife and there was a quarrel, you will not sleep until you settle that quarrel. You know why? He may come in the middle of the night. And how can he come and he finds you outside the spirit fighting a useless battle? How will you explain that? Now you spend all your years serving the Lord and it remains a little while before the master will come and he find you outside. No. So I must start by saying that the matter of preparing adequately for the coming king is requiring a watchful spirit. It's as if you cannot lose your guard. Because it can come anytime. Sometimes when we are talking about the second coming of Christ and we are trying to paint the picture, uh, we give an impression as say, oh, when Jesus is going to come, something will change. The whole environment will change. In fact, you will see the sun will stand still. It will not be like that. The Bible didn't give us that picture. It's just human beings thinking like that. He said, the day of the coming of the Son of Man will be like the day of Noah. How did it happen the day of Noah? He said they were giving in marriage and they were taking in marriage. They were drinking and eating. They were dancing. They were doing normal things. Normal things. Some people were wearing their wedding garments. 
as they were marching to the church. There were churches going on that time too. Are you understanding? Where the pastor is a drunkard and the officiating ministers themselves, they are humanizers. But they have the religion that they were doing. And they continue like that, the Bible says, until Noah entered the ark. God signaled Noah and said, Noah, come to the ark. The end of the whole world has come now. Let's go. By the time Noah entered the ark and the door was shut, and the heavens were released and flood came. Do you know pregnant women were caught? Do you know that babies were swept away? Do you know that some wives were still wearing their wedding garments when they were flooded away? Do you know that the terrible things that happened? And Jesus said, it will be like that. So don't expect that activity will stop. Church program will not stop. All this uh, fall and die prayer will not stop. Are you hearing me? And all the internet, Yahoo, Yahoo boys, they will be doing it. Everything will be going on as normal. That's why the required watchfulness for preparing for the coming bridegroom is much more serious. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, let's now try to study the chapter. At least those 13 verses, I'll try to start it this morning. When I come back in the afternoon, I will continue. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, whenever I had come to look at this parable more deeply, it has left me crying. It has left me very, very sober. Even as I'm still looking at it now, I am still feeling like crying. What are the issues? The first issue that touches me here is that starting is not as important as ending. Are you hearing me? Those who started well is important, but until you have ended well, you have not ended. If you start very nicely, that's good. But we cannot yet shake hands with you until you have ended well. And Jesus did not mean words. So only those that endure to the end shall be what shall be saved. It's not status that we are talking about now. It's not status. There are many great status. There are many good, good, good status. But they never ended well. And I have been touched that so many friends of mine were great starters. But suddenly, something has happened. And they are no more where they stood. Many friends of mine that we used to preach very strongly together. Something has happened. They have changed their messages. They are doing something else now. And some, we even try to make jests of some of us and say, I believe it's still old-fashioned. And I was wondering what will have made the faith we embrace to become old in their eyes, except that something happened to their lives. Now, he said the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Take that verse very quickly. Let's look at it. What is it that they have done? Number one, there were 10 virgins. Excuse me, let me inform you that to, 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 to describe them as 10 as virgins meant they were serious. It meant they have fought battles. Every young lady who remains virgin, they have fought battles. Even now, 
if you have a young lady or a sister who had kept herself as a virgin, that is because she has fought. That meant she has taken a decision, I will not defy myself. If she had remained a virgin, it means she has stood against all the forces of darkness. It means she has fought against social media. It means she has fought against all the new, new, new methodology of committing sin. It means she has stood against so much opposition and ridicule. If you go to university now, it's, it's terrible that girls will just quickly call you as and say, Yes, are you, are you uh, 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 is your eye open? All they are asking is that, have you done it? Say, no, I'm keeping myself for what? What are you keeping yourself for? Eh? Boys will just think that you are not matured, you are not anything. Come along. It's a battle. If you dress one kind and you are not like their own, they say, Kai, you are old fashioned. The trouble that our daughters go through when they go to hostess. And if it was just when they get to university that this challenge is coming to us, it's not. Even in secondary school, it's looked upon as if it's a wrong thing to, be, to, be, to, to, to keep yourself in holiness. Yes. Now, in a generation that is morally decadent, in a generation that is reckless, in a generation where men no longer have the fear of God, these were virgins. And if not because uh, what happened that we saw that some of them were foolish, I would have just put up my two hands and prayed to them and said, these are virgins and they are already settled for heaven. But the story did not allow me to do that. And that's my fear about it. That's what makes me a bit tremble when I look at this issue of preparing for the coming bridegroom. It makes me to think very deeply. So I saw now that former consecration is not sufficient. Hallelujah. Historical consecration cannot take you to the, to the matter. You must not only have an historical or history of consecration, you must be presently and currently consecrated to God that whenever he comes, he finds you so. It's not enough to so in the 80s or in the 70s or in the 1960s or in the early 90s. Oh my God, when we are doing something, when we are doing something, history will not make it. You've got to be correct. You've got to be standing where he can meet you. So sir, when the Lord comes, he will remember everything I've done, everything I've done. It pains me that as I read this story, it was painful that Jesus said, Assuredly, I said to you, I never knew you. I said, Ah, how can you not know the virgins? How can you not know those that were with us? But what matter, what matter to me is that <laughs> according to scriptures, all of you, are you following me? According to scripture, let me tell you something that the scripture says that maybe you don't always remember. So if a man has been righteous all his life, are you hearing me? He has been consistent, he has been doing well, he has been preaching, he has been singing, he has been giving, he has been serving God all his life. He has been doing well. Righteous. And then the Bible said, and he turns to sin. He turns to wickedness. What did the Bible say about all his righteousness? I told you we talk to me, please. Eh? It shall be forgotten. I said, ah. 
which means 30 years of meritorious service to the Lord. 30 years of fighting against the devil. 30 years of standing consistently. 30 years of, 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 of standing for God sacrificially can be immediately obliterated, canceled, forgotten just by one month of turning to wickedness. That is the issue. It bothers me that even the souls that you brought to the Lord in the days where you were standing, all those records, they say, ah, by the grace of God, when you came to our campus in 1986, oh, you preached and I changed. Oh, I met you in 1982. When you came to our village, you preached, my life was changed. Oh, but I believe I saw you when I was a student in 1991. And you came, you taught us this song, you did this one, you did the one, and my life has changed. I've been praying to meet you. Can you imagine that all of those things will be forgotten? Hebrew like Billy turns to sin. And I saw that, ah, that is a possibility. That is something you can joke with. If it is that there is accumulated holiness. Are you hearing me? If it's like what you do in the university, when you call it cumulative uh, GPA, it's wonderful that somebody may be 4.5 uh, GPA at a uh, 100 level and uh, 4.3 and 4.2 at 300 level, but he came to 400 level and he drops to something like 2.1. Does that mean he will not graduate? He will graduate because he will do what? Cumulative and you do the average, he may not get to something, he may fall around three, he will see go, not in heaven. Your final score finalizes you. Your final stand is your finality. Where will he meet you when he comes? How will you be when he comes? What will you be doing when he comes? That's what matters. And when I see that, I now know that, oh, what will I believe was two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, is good only if it continues. Only if it continues. My record will only build up, build up, build up, build up, and it will be talked about if only I do what? I continue. If it meets me, so do we. They were virgins who fought against the devil. They fought against immorality. They fought against everything. Number two, they took their lambs. They took their lambs. You see, words are very important to me when I study the Bible. They took their lambs. You know the meaning of that? They took their lambs. They took their lights. They were personal. Each one of them knew in the beginning that you must have your lamps. You will not see the Lord with the lamp of another brother. I saw that in preparation. We may have general fellowship discussion like this, 
But meeting the Lord is a personal matter. Hey, my brother, are you hearing me? Or am I over talking? Eh? Hey, my God. When he will come, we can only see him one by one. See how we're all sitting here. We are the Calvary uh, Ministries people. And we are the people talking about missions. And we are the people doing like this. And we thank God for our lives. And we are brethren. And we are from our chapters. And all of that. That's okay. But when the trumpet sounds, Dr. Abba, will you be available to gather the brethren and say, all the couple chapter in Makodi, I heard the sound of the trumpet. Let us join hands together so that we'll fly together. Will it happen like that, sir? No. No. If you don't have what it takes to fly, we will not meet you. He said, we will meet in the air. These are the things that touches me. We will only do what? Meet in the air. Wherever you are, when the trumpet sounds and you are able to rise, we meet there. When we get in the air around the Lord, sir, bro, you are here. Ah, sister, ah, praise God. Ah, praise God. Say, what up, sister? Sister Rhoda. You hear her voice quickly say, don't look back. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. There will be no opportunity to even look back and say, but I've not seen sister so-and-so. I've not seen brother this. I've not seen brother that. Let's quickly look for that one so that we can go together. He used to be in our fellowship. There will be no chance. I'm begging God to give you understanding to help us to prepare. And you might be saying, ah, but I believe, you know, we are already serious. We are already preparing for Jesus. Uh, go and talk to those ones that are reckless. Uh, if this message was for those who are reckless, I would not have worried. But these virgins, they were not drunkards. Were they drunkards? Talk to me, were they drunkards? Were they reckless? Look at the Bible. He said they took their lamps. They did one more thing that I thought I should, I should ask you to look at. The Bible said, like in the ten virgins, virgins, who took their lamps. So each one of them had light and went out. Went out of where? Did you see the language? They went out. That's to tell you that they went out. They went out of sin. They went out of the world. They went out of the sinful community. They went out. They were separated. They were called out. They were already recognizing that we don't belong to the world. They already told themselves, I don't belong to this world. And they went out with one singular purpose. What was the purpose? To meet the bridegroom. Look at that. That's what, that's the setting that makes the message in this uh, uh, parable very serious for me. We are not talking of careless people at all. We are not talking of people that say I'm a Christian but are still in the bear parlor. We are not talking of those ones that are still moving up and down with the harlots. We are not talking of those, those kind of people. That's why, brother, that's why, listen to me. If it is this serious, even with those that are serious, how do you think it will be with all those ones that are gathering and you are, you are wondering whether they have left the world or they have not left the world. If it is this critical, even with these ones that kept themselves, that took their lamps, that went out, out of the world, out of sin, out of compromise, out of everything that could be a hindrance to their lives. 
and they had a focus. What was their focus? To meet the bridegroom. They were already set, we are meeting the bridegroom. We will meet the bridegroom. We are ready for the bridegroom. We are waiting for him. All of us are waiting for this bridegroom. Unfortunately, the Bible now began to introduce something. Say so now, five of them were wise and five were foolish. If not because this particular verse two was brought in and God was going to introduce to us what is the definition of the foolish and the definition of the wise, I'd like to tell you that foolishness or wisdom was not written on their faces. Oh my God, did you hear me? When they were in the fellowship, 10 of them were sitting singly. Nobody was put in labor and said, foolish, wise, wise. There was nothing like that. They were all sisters. But what made them, what defines them to be foolish or wise is in their preparation. Not in their initial preparation, but in their present current preparation. And I'd like you to see, I pray that I can do that before I move you to the place of prayer. Now, five of them were wise and five were foolish. And the Bible said, those who were foolish, they took their lamps. They took their lamps, quite all right. But they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their lamp, in their vessels with their lamps. Verse 3 and verse 4, they are very critical verses. But I want you to relax so that as we are studying and as we are looking at scripture, you might be able to think deeply of what is it that God is speaking to us about in this time. Now, look the Bible. They took their lamps. And brethren, I want you to know that they did not take empty lamps. Honestly, when they were going, their lamps were burning. Eh? Their lamps were burning. But you know the problem. Can you imagine the problem? The problem was that in their calculation, they did not anticipate that the bridegroom will outlast or outstay the oil in their lamp. They were thinking that no how, no how, the bridegroom will be here before this oil will finish. Did you understand? They thought it's only that they did not think completely well. They thought that this land should last. The master will soon come. And when he comes, once I got my lamp to see him, that's all. They did not plan that the master would do what? We delay. Should I go ahead? Eh? I think in their plans, they never expected that there would be any elongation of waiting. 
They imagine that as we started, we will soon finish. The boy will soon come. So they made a preparation for the immediate. They did not prepare for the journey that may be beyond what they thought. So this preparation I'm talking about is a preparation that makes allowance allowance for unexpected delays. And I want to tell you, do you know that if the Lord Jesus had come, if he had come by the end of verse 2, are we going to have a project to know whether somebody was foolish or wise? I think you need to talk to me. Eh? We would have thought all of them were what? Were wise because they have lamps. The, the deficiency of the foolish ones only became manifest because the bridegroom delayed. I would like to tell you, I don't know why the Lord has decided to delay. I don't know. It's only that I knew later on in the second Peter that the Lord was not slack according to his promise. As some people are thinking that God is slack, and you have been saying it's coming, it's coming, it's not coming, so uh, let's just relax. So, but God has only was holding so that those that ought not to perish, are you understanding? Should actually be saved. The long suffering of the Lord is for our deliverance, for our salvation. That's what Sir Computer finally said. But unfortunately, that's the problem now. The long suffering of the Lord to bring many more to the kingdom of God, as you hearing me, has become the doom of some brothers and sisters. I imagine if the Lord had come many years back when some of you were ready, maybe many of my friends would have gone to heaven. But unfortunately, because they delayed, began, people began to say, look, why are we heavenly conscious? I we are earthly irrelevant. Let's enjoy ourselves in this world. After all, we don't know when it's going to come. We say it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. We have been saying it's coming all this year. It has not come. Me, I will set you down. Because the master delayed. Their oil ran out. So the Bible said, but why the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. So please permit me to note with you. There is a level of preparation that we must engage. I call it irreducible minimum preparation for the coming of the Lord. What do I mean by that? Yes, because of the delay, the Bible said they all slumbered and slept. Are you hearing me? Why they were slumbering and sleeping, some sisters, they did not slumber to an extent as not to have oil in their lamp. There's an irreducible minimum. I'm just telling God, help me to prepare myself to such a point that even if there's any reason for me to slumber, and I'm doing like this, doing like this, doing like this, if they say, the bridegroom is here, I should still have what it takes to make it to heaven. I don't know why you're hearing what I'm saying. That even when he looks and say, oh, but I believe it's not tired. Hey, but I believe it's not this, all of that. It has no reach and extent that if there's a cry, shama, that I will not be able to stand 
and gather all I needed to catch up with him. My preparation was there to that level. They said, hey, hey, hey. how do I put it? I'm not praying to fall. Are you hearing me? I'm not praying to slumber. I'm not praying to sleep. I'm not praying for anything. I want to be on fire till it comes. And I don't want to sleep. In fact, if sleep is coming at five stay, I say, no, I'm waiting for the Lord. I'm waiting for the Lord. But let's imagine sleep catches me. The slightest noise. He has come. I should still be eh? minimally ready for his appearing. That's the level of preparation I'm talking about. I'm looking for a preparation for his coming. That even if anything were to happen and the natural and whatever seem to have, you know, uh, affected my physical body, my spirit should be at last. May God help us in the name of Jesus. The Bible said, they said all of them. Because the bridegroom was delayed. I think the old King James that I used to, that is my language, said, why the bridegroom tarried? I think that's how the old King James put it. Why the bridegroom tarried? They all slumbered and slept. But there's one matter that I'm pressing upon you uh, that will lead us into prayer. Your preparation for his coming. Does he forestall eventual delays? Are you preparing for his coming to such a point that even if it should delay to such an extent that everybody thinks he will not come again. And everybody saying, let's just go and sleep, he's not coming again. It's your preparation to such an extent that even at that, what it will take to meet him, you still have it. So I want a preparation that is beyond eventuality. I want to prepare myself for his coming in such a manner that even if all else around me were sleeping and I could not do otherwise but to also sleep with them, when the trumpet sounds, I should still be found worthy to stand before him. What do I mean by that now? Brothers, what do I think? What do you think I'm saying? What is the word of God bringing to us out of this? What is the Holy Ghost wanting us to say? You know, I'm doing a general thing this morning. When I come back, the particular issues which I raise. The Bible said, But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered, they all slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. I will not spend time looking at that cry. That cry is our thing. But I will bring that cry later on. But I want you to see, at midnight, a cry was heard. And the instruction was, behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Do you remember that in verse 1, they went out to meet the bridegroom. Am I right? They were already on the journey to meet him. And if verse 1 was immediately followed with verse 5 or verse 6, we would not have been talking about wise or foolish. 
because they were already going out to meet him. But I saw something between the beginning of the journey to go and meet the Lord and the time the Lord finally came, there was an intervening space in which we are being up to now. That intervening space. Because we, when we first gave our life to Christ, the message that He's coming back again. My Lord is coming back again. He went away and promised that he's coming back for me. That was our song. So we were thinking that by latest, by next month, he will have arrived. It took grace for some of us to go to school. Because when you wanted to go to school, the brother will walk up to you and say, uh -huh. If the law comes, what will you do with this certificate? Our understanding was so, <laughs> was like the Thessalonians. Who let everything, they were not working again. They just gather every money to say, He's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, until Paul said, No. Where the carcass are, there the egos gather. Keep working. Go and do whatever you can do. But don't forget that it's coming. And get yourself prepared. Make sure your lamp is trimmed. So that if it comes in the night, if it comes in the day, if it knocks at midnight, you are ready to open for him. Our understanding had to change. So we said, okay, all right, all right. I can be touching in the classroom. If the trumpet sounds, the church will drop, I will go. I can be preaching on the pulpit. If the trumpet sounds, I will drop and I'll go. If I were in the hospital working, treating the patients, I'll be telling the patients that I start this surgery, but if the Lord comes, I may leave you here and I'm gone. We were, we were taught like that. Say, so we may be in a car driving, and if the driver is a child of heaven, and is qualified to fly, if the trumpet comes, what will happen? We will just only discover that the driver has gone. We don't know what will happen to those that are left. We are not cared about that. I just want to be ready to go. We were taught like that. So we never thought that there would be a delay. But there was a delay. And all of you, you can see that there had been a delay. Abi? Eh? All of you, you can see that it looks as if the master has delayed. Because of my own heart, I never expect that I will be alive in this wicked world. And they'll be talking of uh, gay marriage. I know there's a message in the Bible, and we preach against them with complete abba. How can you be an homosexual and be bold to come into fellowship? You were ashamed. In fact, you came sickly and said, do you know I have this problem? Let's pray for me. And we pray and say, no, repent. But I never know that I will be in a world when sin will multiply and the love of many will wax cold. That there will be homosexuals who are bold enough to march to church and say, join us in marriage. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine that there will be pastors, pastors, pastors who will have audacity to do that kind of journey. Then I don't, I was not thinking I would be alive when I would be, I would see a pastor who will boldly say, and I am gay. I never thought that it would become a discussion and it would be legalized. I thought I would have gone away. I never expected that a church synod, synod, we have to sit down and they will vote and they will say that homosexuality is correct in their church. I never expected. But I'm now alive. I'm seeing that. I'm seeing them talking about transgender, about I'm seeing terrible things that I never thought can be seen. 
I knew there were kidnappers in the Bible. You know, the word of God told us about men stealers. Huh? Oh my, you didn't understand. Men stealers, they are kidnappers. It was in the Bible. So the thing that we are seeing here is not new. They have been there before. But I never thought that it would become a trade. And that it would become something. And that we will have a government that cannot stand and rescue its people. I never imagined. Why did the bridegroom tarried? All this has happened. Why did the bridegroom tarried? Many, many vices that we never expected in the church has come. Why did the bridegroom tarried? I never thought all this trouble would be here. It has come. I never expected that me, I'll be alive and I'll be seeing this kind of contradiction every time, every time, every time, every time. But it is happening. But, but, what was the plan? Before the bridegroom is come, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose. How many of the virgins arose, please? All the ten. That was also a very important matter to me. They all arose. All of them arose. And as we are rising, they instantaneously knew that you got to trim your life. Praise the Lord. All of them knew what to do. And I want to tell all of you here. When the Lord will come, you will not need anybody to tell you what to do to appear before him. You yourself, you will know certain things that you are doing, but you cannot appear with it before him. They all knew we must trim our lives. And by the, by the instinct, they began to trim their lamps. The foolish also tried to trim their lamp. But the more they are bringing it up like this, the more it is going down. Why? No oil. The oil has finished. They trim it again. The thing was dying out. And then the foolish they said to the wise, my sister, please give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. Again, I have two questions for myself there. What are my own questions? My first question was, I thought that they needed lamp to wait so that they are not waiting in darkness. But now he has come. Do they need lamp to see him? And even if they need lamp, if 10 of us are in a place and five had lamp, is that not enough for all of us to see the road? Eh? Unfortunately, it was clear to the five virgins that you cannot borrow another sister's lamp to see him. Your lamp has to be born. Suddenly, it became clear to them. We cannot say, okay, let's use your lamp together. Mm -mm. So they said, please, our lamps are going out. Give us some of your oil. We are not saying, give us oil. Let's just share it. Hey, these other sisters, the way they spoke, touched my heart again. 
I thought that even if they just got a small drop of oil, it would have been enough, Abi, just to see him. But those sisters, they were very, very calculated, they said, so that it will not be insufficient for us and for you. Even though we know that the Bible has come, is at the door, and we should go out and meet him. Between now and when we meet him, we don't know whether the journey will still be long. We don't want a situation where we'll start and our own lamp also will go out and we'll be meeting him in darkness. It's better for you, sister. Go and do what? Go and buy your own. That's where I think the matter became serious. At midnight. At midnight, all honest businessmen should be sleeping. Am I right? And anybody who has a genuine oil should also have been waiting to meet the Lord. He should not be in the market. If there's one man that can give you oil, when the bridegroom has already arrived, I'm telling you, that oil is fake. He himself must be a useless businessman who is selling the oil of anointing. When the master is already at the door, but someone is still selling, that kind of oil is a dangerous oil. In fact, I would say it's an oil, eh? an oil for darkness. By the time the sisters said to them, you better go and buy. Because we cannot jeopardize. Let it not be enough. Let it not be that it is not enough for us and for you. Go rather to do so sell and buy for yourselves. All those things they are saying there is, is it troubles me. Because the kind of oil you need for heaven is not the one you go and buy. Say, come to me. Eh? I will give you oil to anoint your eyes out. Buy of me without money. Why do you spend money on that which is not eternal? If anybody is there telling you that sow a seed and collect the anointing, he is a liar. As long as you are getting that kind of oil, you are preparing for hell. Be very careful. And there will be many of them in the end time. They will feel the whole place. They are in business. But they are not in the business of going to heaven. So, when Jesus was about to conclude that, the Bible said, why they went to buy? In my mind, I will just, my mom was just following these sisters. I hope you know that they were going out to buy with a sense that, ah, we were waiting for for years. Where we made our virgins for ourselves, virgins for is about to be lost. Why did we oversleep? Why didn't we have enough oil in our in our vessel? Why did we make that omission? They were asking questions. This is that the brother was in that thing. And Cecilia was saying the brother, but why why did we say the brother said it's not the time to be doing any exercises now? Let's just get oil. Then the other sister, Rhoda, was asking, I said, do you think Jesus will shut the door without us? Let's quickly get this one first. I don't know where they went. I don't know whether they got the oil. I don't know the businessman that sold oil to them. But what I heard, that was the painful thing. Why they went to buy? 
the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. The door of salvation was shut. The door of forgiveness shut. The door to glory was shut. Doors of opportunity shut. The door of grace was shut. The door of mercy was shut. And the door was shut. And when these sisters came back, I want you to read what they said. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, they knew his name. They knew his name. They had the language. Unfortunately, the door was shut. A time comes when prayer will be of no use. Lord, Lord, open for us. And the master, the master, the bridegroom had an answer and said, Very little I say unto you, I do not know you. That is a very bad case for me. How can you say you did not know me? Sister Runke. How can he say he doesn't know me? Please tell him, tell him, tell him. Remind him what I used to do for him. Remind him as I cast out devils. You know, when I came to this, and I remember what he said in Matthew 7, when this one came and said, Lord, in your name we cast out devils, in your name we did what, in your name we preach, in your name we say, I never knew you. You are workers of iniquity. So these sisters again, virgins, but who are not prepared, the same answer, I don't know you. What will I do in my lifetime? And the Lord Jesus will completely forget that I've ever had anything to do with him. What will I do in my life? And everything I have done for my God will be so forgotten that the only answer will be, I never knew you. How will I misplace my life in a manner that all my boomer boomer for Jesus will end with one word? Honestly, I don't know you. That's the conclusion of that passage. And Jesus now said, What therefore? Can you look at the word therefore? In verse 13. Did you see the word therefore? Eh? What is the reason for the word therefore? The word therefore means consequent upon this. Because this is a reality. This is a possibility. This is not something we are just gambling about. This is something that can happen and will happen. Therefore, therefore, 
watch. For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. What therefore? So, what is my concluding point on which we are going to conclude for this section of this uh, message? All the story I have tried to describe shows me again that I have been there is not sufficient. I used to be there. It's not tenable. I was in the midst of the brethren. I was in the choir. I was that. It's not the issue. If you are not there when he comes, he never knows you. If you are not there, Is a saying that I, I should stop. Is that what you people are saying? I will stop, but don't stop me yet. Now, I say historical Christianity, historical faith, history, we started it together. We were there together. Ah, we prayed together. It's not sufficient. What matters are you there when the trumpet sounds? When it comes, are you there? Or you are out somewhere? When the master appears, are you ready, prepared to meet him? Watch, therefore. So you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. What kind of preparation? My preparation is a preparation that is current, that is functional, that is not intermittent. Why should it not be intermittent? Because you do not know the hour. The hour. You know neither the day nor the hour. This kind of instructions is too meticulous. You don't know neither the day. And even if you know the day, you do not know what? The hour. When you will come. So what is the answer? Watch. Watch, therefore. But if we go away from Matthew 25 and go to the book of Luke, chapter 12, maybe we should read that one as we draw our conclusion. Luke 12, they are all dealing with one issue, but when you come to Luke 12, in verse 45, Luke 12, 45, and I'll get as far as verse 46. 
But if you like, you can read it down, down, down until you get to the end of verse 48. But I don't want to go to verse 48 because it's raising other issues that we cannot raise now. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him. And at an hour when he is not aware, and he will cut him in sunder and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Again, this is a complete red letter instruction. Am I right? Coming from the mouth of the Lord Jesus. Let me repeat it again. Because I'm doing it with our Matthew 25, verse 13. He said, but if that servant says in his heart, so brothers, every carelessness is first of all a carelessness of where? Of the heart. Every omission, every lukewarmness, every quiet deviation always start from the heart. So if you are going to find yourself losing out, the first place that you have lost is the heart. And I'm telling you, there are many decisions I see people making because they have said something in their heart. If that servant says in his heart, my master will delay his coming. All this giri 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 is coming, it's coming, it's coming. Let's relax. All this preaching about second coming, second coming, second coming. Let's relax. Let's say something that is of the earth. Let's tell ourselves that we will make it here. Sometimes people, when they want to misbehave, they don't say, this chaos with the second coming. This chaos with all this message about sin. They have said something in their heart that is not as serious as we are taking it. That's how they said in the days of Noah. That was what they were saying to themselves in Sodom and Gomorrah. Until suddenly their destruction came. And I know that our generation is saying like that. I know serious brothers who have decided not to be loose, they said something in their heart. Preachers of holiness that are not preaching holiness. They say something in their heart. I had gone to preach in a church. They invited me to preach in a one church in the UK. And I asked the pastor, I said, do you really want me to preach here? Ah, he said, Brother Billy, we need you, we need you, we need you. I think he thought that when you manage to bring Brother Gwile for your church, he gathers a crowd. And he was happy because people said, if Brother Gwile come in, he said, come here, he will be there. So they came, there was a crowd. And that evening, as I was praying, the Lord said, nothing but the truth must you tell these people. So as I opened the scriptures, and we begin to speak. I saw the excitement coming down. Those who came to hear the word of God, they were, they, this is how they stood. But the man of God was jittery. 
He was walking up and down. When we finished, and I gave out a call, and all the people that he has regarded as workers were running out to correct their lives. Those that have been telling lies in order to get visa, they are coming and say, Pastor, I can't do that again. I want to go to heaven. Those who did arrange marriage, just to get paper, they were coming out and say, mm -mm, we deceived ourselves. My wife is at home. Sister, I had no plan to, my wife is at home. They are crying for me. We will stop this thing. It's nonsense. I'm not doing it again. The following year, I went to preach. The man that used to arrange my itinerary went and told the pastor, so that the is around. Would you like to have him? He said, ah, no, no, no. We have not recovered from the one he did last year. We have not recovered. My church scattered. The people were crying. They were crying that they want their lives to be correct. So, those ones that used to come gri -gri, they are no more around. They are seriously looking for their lives now. Don't do that below again. I've not recovered what happened to us last year. I need people that can help me gather, gather people. Yes, they have said something in their heart. When you see a man who stopped preaching the truth, who is only begging issues, he has said something in his heart. When you see yourself going where you don't used to go before, you have said something in your heart. When you find yourself beginning to be loose, the kind of thing you don't used to watch, you are watching it. You have said something in your heart. And what did you say in your heart? This man says, my master is delaying his coming. And so it begins. Scriptures, it begins. That means he now starts doing what he was not doing before. It begins to beat the male and the female servants. It begins to treat them carelessly. It begins to play around with souls of men. It begins to play with sin. It begins, it begins, uh, and you must watch strange beginnings. You must ask yourself, what are beginning to happen to my life now? What is this thing that is beginning with me? Why is am I beginning now? I don't used to do this before. What is beginning with me now? What is happening to my heart? Every backsliding has a beginning. Every deviation has a beginning. Every compromise has a beginning. And every losing out has a beginning. Has a beginning. And if you are going to help yourself, you must trap the beginnings. Trap one beginnings and say, eh, 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 eh. Don't begin this in my life. Don't begin this in my life. Don't begin these things in my heart. Don't begin this thing with me. Don't begin this thing with me. And he begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and to drink and to be drunk. It's all a beginning somewhere. My friend, what is it that is beginning with you? Eh? What is it that is beginning with you? The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him. And at an hour when he is not aware. And we cut him in two. We cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. May God not allow that to happen to you in the name of Jesus. And that servant 
who made his master sweet and did not prepare himself, although according to his will, shall be better with many, many stripes. There are some persons that maybe they did not know. They have not been exposed to the word of God. The things that have been taught, they have not been taught. You know, I'm talking to you because we are capable people. We are capable people. We, we, there are things we, we don't do. There are things you will not find in our midst. But when it begins, when it begins, as we call on God this morning, as we stop at this point to say, okay, God, what do you want to do with my life? Preparing adequate preparation for the coming king, for the coming bridegroom. Not history, but the current. Not what we used to do, but what we are currently doing. Not what we hope to do, but what we are doing now. Oh, I will get ready for him. I will get ready for him. It's not adequate. The language I want to hear from you is, I am ready, Lord. If you come now, Lord, I'm ready. And if you delay your coming, I will keep being ready. Anytime, anyhow, anywhere, Lord, make me ready. Make me ready. Make me ready for your coming. I will give you space now to pray with me. And I will give you space to meditate and reflect. I will give you space to say, Lord, in a world where everybody is doing anything they like, in a world where even church, pastors, it didn't matter to them anymore, the life of sin. People have become so clever to do anything and do it very well. Perfected in, in hypocrisy. Lord. 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 I've already come out to meet you. The last thing that always bothered me is say, those five sisters that didn't make it finally. Virgins. I imagine the boys that were pushing them. Say, hey, Cecilia, you didn't make it finally. Even those of us that did not even try to go out anywhere, we didn't go out. I live in my sin as I liked. So you are still coming back to meet us. We better set it down. Let's just, we know our own destiny. We are going nowhere. How can Cecilia say to them? It's better to make it. I don't know what those drunkards will be saying. I think you left everything, you left us here. If you know you don't make it, you should have said to here with us. We knew we are going to hell. So we are preparing ourselves for it. For you now, you are going to follow us to hell. After you have suffered your life for nothing, let it not be so. Let's pray together. Please go to God in prayer.
just talk to God. Make me ready, make me ready, make me ready, make me ready, in the night, anytime you may come, make me ready for you, make me ready. Make me ready. Make me ready, woman. In the morning, in the night, anytime you may come. Make me ready, woman. While you are praying, I want you to talk to God first. This particular story is for those that have not even come out. This message was spread to those who are still maybe in the house of the Lord. It will not have been so much. But the new thoughts will have come out. You have made some sacrifice. You took a step. Friends and relatives you already love that too. What to eat? What will it be for you not to make it at last? What is beginning to happen in your life now? Can I ask you to pray about it? What is the game that is creeping into your life now? What is it that your heart is beginning to say? I would like to say to God, even this morning, even this world, even this living of God, not knowing the day or the hour we have never come. We have signaled and said, Baba, it's a love, come over. My dear brother, what is that thing that is beginning with you? You need to be serious. We are beginning now. About the bush. We are beginning now to slack. The things you promised God never to do again. You see yourself turning back to it, touching it, quietly touching the unclean. My friend, can we pray together? Can you say, Lord, please prepare me. Lord, make me ready for your coming. Don't allow me to, to stay. We didn't know the, the sisters were foolish until their omission made them foolish. Can you check? As we pray together, I'd like to pray with you. And I want you to say thanks for us to come and go together. But if this morning, the Holy Spirit is quietly urging you to say, There's some oil in the lamp again. We are beginning to dry up. The young man is dry up. The freshness of us to bring the Jesus is making the way. We do know that
do anything, you just shout your peace, peace, peace. He says, suddenly, the destruction came. Where are you right there? Where are you right there? Where are you right there? In this city or anywhere else where we have been collecting votes, it's time for all to pray. All hands are bowed, all hearts are praying. We just feel that I need a fresh touch. I don't want to walk there and find you for the oil. They will empty their suits and tears as this will be for a couple of months. Feel my heart afresh. The oil you gave me before has dried. Father, touch me afresh. Do a new thing in my heart. I'm trimming my lamb when it's not trimming. Because oil is finished. This is it, oh God, help my soul. Thank you. 